Hey friends, today we're continuing our PM Diary series where we're going to be talking about one concept that's very special to my heart, which is what are the biggest struggles that I'm experiencing as a project manager? And hopefully you guys can also relate to everything that I'm experiencing. Again, just like our other PM Diaries videos, this is meant to be a sit down chit chat where you and I just get to know each other one on one as if I'm talking to you in person over the phone where we just get to know each other. Let's learn from each other and let's figure out ways to grow in our careers. As we go through this video, I do have some of the key concepts and topics that I wanna talk about for this video. But before we do get started, leave me a comment down below. What are the, some of the biggest challenges and struggles that you're experiencing as a project manager? And if you're not a project manager, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're going through? Now, right now for me, one of the biggest challenges and struggles that I'm experiencing is having to go through back to back to back to back meetings almost all day. Sometimes I'll even be in back to back meetings from like 9 a.m. to 11.30, then maybe I'll have a quick lunch and then 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. So my, my day will be literally backed with all these meetings because I have to touch base with not just my team, but also have one-on-ones with key stakeholders, managers, maybe even some directors, just to make sure that my projects continue to stay on track. It could be a weekly touch point, a daily sync, uh, a steering committee, and just one-on-ones with my manager or those that I'm working with. So I'm always in a discussion with my team or even outside suppliers. So it's definitely challenging. Some things that I've learned to better navigate this challenge that I am just struggling with is, first, I like to keep a cup of water right next to my desk. I personally like to use a Yeti cup because it keeps my water warm, and I'll usually fill it up with a cup of you know, a green tea, for example, and that usually helps keep my voice and my throat hydrated. Now, the other thing that I like to do is very recently, I wanna say back in summer of last year, I invested into a standing desk. And that literally has saved me, not just my ergonomics and my posture, but also helped give me some more mobility anytime I'm working. So when I do have these long two to three hours of just sitting in back-to-back -back meetings, I actually don't literally sit. I actually use my standing desk. And so after one meeting ends, Hopefully, one meeting ends five minutes early, I'll readjust myself and I'll push that standing desk button to go up higher and then I'll stand. And then for the next meeting, I'll sit down and then I'll rinse and repeat that over the course of the entire day so that my body doesn't still, doesn't stay stuck just sitting on my, you know, on my, on my chair the whole day. Um, other things I found helpful is if I really do have a really long meeting, and I do have a 10 minute break or even a five minute break, I do like to keep a quick snack on standby. And I personally like munching on like seeds. So it could be sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, or anything that's kind of healthy and nutritious because I, like I mentioned before in my previous uh, creating a vision board and setting my goals for this year, I want to eat more nutritiously healthy foods. So not necessarily junk food, but more like fruits and seeds. So almonds, walnuts, pumpkin seeds, um, and then fruits. So apples, um, bananas, or even just having like a drink next to me, right? The other thing that's been extremely helpful to really just stay on top of all the meetings I have is making sure that I can access all of my documentation ahead of my meetings. If I know that I have a critical discussion set up for a vendor, for example, what I'll do is I'll prepare the agenda and the critical topics to discuss with them ahead of time, right? And so I'll we'll have you know action items that we discussed previously and then commitments that we need to follow up on for the next week. And then I'll also have my project timeline pulled up as well as the raid log, risks, assumptions, all those different things, and maybe like a PowerPoint slide deck of items that we need to talk about. So we'll have all of that ready before we actually have that meeting. And so if I know that I have 
three meetings scheduled back to back from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. I will literally have all of those files and maybe even those um, those web browsers already pulled up on the screen and I'll just minimize them for those different discussions. And that has saved me at least 30 minutes of my time so I don't have to switch my brain as hard as I used to before I would literally change on the cuff, right? Just like, like that. But now I plan way ahead. So right when I go into work, I'll plan ahead and I'll say, okay, I have these meetings. So I need to have these topics. These are the desired outcomes that we need to achieve. These are the critical milestones that we need to hit that are tied to our critical path. And if it's a project that's related to Agile, then I'll look at the Kanban board and see what tasks are assigned to who, what are we trying to accomplish in the next two weeks, things like that. So yeah, those, those are all the things that are tied to one of my biggest struggles I've been having working as a project manager. All right, so my second biggest struggle that I'm experiencing as a project manager, and hopefully this also resonates with you guys, is that I struggle to keep track of everything that I'm managing. I have such a big, crazy workload that it feels like this huge flood of water just rushing in on me. My current job title at my current company is a manager of project management. What that means is that not only do I manage projects, but I also manage an entire portfolio of projects. So I right now I manage between five to 10 projects, which is a lot. But on top of that, I manage a portfolio which consists of anywhere from 50 to 100 projects. It's a lot of work. So it can be challenging being able to switch my mind from, all right, I'm working on this project and I'm going all in. I'm zooming in with a magnifying lens and seeing what the details are to make this project a success. But then in the blink of an eye, I have to switch and I have to go into portfolio program management mode and then I have to oversee this entire portfolio and see how are all of our projects doing at the 100,000 foot level? And it's been a challenge. So when I first started the role, you know, I was like, man, how do I manage not just the project level, but also the portfolio level? And it was, it was challenging. But I've learned that I need to be able to zoom in, understand the details, and then whoo, zoom out, right? So learn how to understand the tasks that are tied to the project. But even more though, you also have to understand the strategic vision of how all the projects are being related to each other. Luckily, my portfolio of the 50 plus projects is separate from the other projects that I'm managing. But even then, it's very important to be able to zoom in and zoom out, right? If you're managing a portfolio of 50 plus projects, it's so important to create reports and dashboards that are automated. If you haven't automated or standardized how you collect data, how you collect reports, you could even use Excel, Microsoft Project, or whatever your company is using from the portfolio project management side. As long as you create exhaustive data analytic reports that you can pull with a click of a button, it reduces so much burden for you to have to sift through all this data. It just pulls it all and you can see the statuses of all the projects within and see what key metrics they're actually adhering to and if you are on track within budget and if you're still in scope. So it's very helpful. So I recommend, and this is what I've done myself, is understanding what are the key metrics that your director or your senior manager or you know the boss of that functional group, what are the key metrics that they want to track? And then create a report, an automated report that will collect and track that information. That way you can pull it every two weeks or every month and then you can report to it to the steering committee or even to your director of how your portfolio is doing on a week to week or bi-weekly basis. That's something that I've implemented in my own projects and it's actually helped me pretty well. Before I had that automated system, I would spend 10 plus hours a week working more than you know 50 hours a week just to create that information. But once I put that into place, it saves so much burden and it saves so much headache and frustration that I had to go through every time I had to pull all these reports and dashboards, right? 
So lesson number one is know how to zoom in and zoom out. Number two is create dashboards and reports. And number three, this is something that I've learned very gradually since I was working as an engineer and then slowly transitioning into project management, which is learn how to say no when your workload is too high. If you simply have too much work on your plate, then learn to say no. Before when I was starting out in my career, I would gladly say yes to any new task or project because I just wanted the responsibility and I wanted to learn as much as I could. As I've matured and as I've gained more experience, you know, I've learned to appreciate having a work-life balance. If you say yes to every single thing that's on like that's given to you, you're not doing yourself justice and you're also not doing justice to the people you're working with because you're going to feel so much more overwhelmed. You'll feel so much more stressed out, which means that you can't give 100% of yourself or even 200% of yourself to deliver the same kind of quality that you could deliver if you had a much more leveled out workload. So I encourage you, if you're feeling stressed out or if you're overwhelmed, say no to projects if you're already working above capacity, unless, unless you're in that position or in that company where it's really expected of you that you need to pull in this weight plus more. But that's another topic for a separate video. So learn to say no so you can balance your workload and manage the expectations of those you work with. Don't be in the position where you're doing a lot more work for less money, right? You're paid for the responsibilities that are in your job description. If you keep offering to do more and more and more work, you know, it may seem like you're going to be given that promotion. But if you don't actually tell your manager that, hey, I'm doing this work because I want to be considered for the opportunity, that may not happen. So just keep that in mind that you don't voluntarily sign up for more work if it won't lead to a job promotion or an increase in your salary. And my third biggest struggle that I'm experiencing, which hopefully you can also relate, is that getting people to actually listen to me when I tell them to do something, right? I am a project manager, but just because I have the word manager in my job title doesn't necessarily mean that I have the authority of these people. These people who work on the projects that I manage, they don't report up to me, right? I work in a company that's a functional organization. So there's engineers, there's analysts, there's people from supply chain, etc. But they all don't they don't they don't directly report up to me. They report to a different manager. So how do you get people to listen to you if you're not their direct boss? And that's something that I first struggled with when I just became a project manager. And it's something that I've learned over the past few years is how do I hold someone accountable for their work? And I still struggle with this to this date because some people, you know, there will always be someone who you work with who will not listen to you, regardless of your authority, regardless of your seniority. They just, they're just hard headed and they won't listen to you. Raise your hand or even leave me a comment down below if you can, if you can resonate with that. What I've learned to do is I ask no oriented questions instead of asking yes oriented questions. And this is a concept that I learned from Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference, right? Instead of asking, are we on track for this week? Change that to say, what activities are we doing to stay on track for this week? When you change it in this way, the other person is actually going to give you a lot more information versus if they just say yes or no to you. Before, when I say, are we on track this week? They would just say, yep, we're on track. And they didn't volunteer any other information. And it would feel like I'm trying to extract that information from them as if they were in a dentist and I had to take all these tools to pull out that missing tooth, to pull out that teeth, right? Now, when you say, what activities are we doing to stay on track? It forces them to actually think, to tell you what they're actually going to be planning, to committing to getting done in the week. The other things that I like to do is, instead of saying, do you or are you, right? I'll say, 
how are we doing with procuring parts? How are we doing with X, Y, and Z? Because it shifts the mindset from saying yes or no, right? To actually listing out what the activities or what the deliverables are. The other thing that I like to do is I've also started using different kinds of words and adjectives. So I say, to hold the person more accountable for their responsibilities, I'll say, can we count on you to have this report ready by end of Friday? Versus, will you have the report ready by Friday? No, I change it and I say, can we count on you to have the report done by Friday? It's a very subtle shift. And what I did is I used the word we and count on. Just those two words indicates the feeling of being in a team. And then counting on, you know, when someone says, can I count on you? It just, it makes you feel like you need to elevate and just take full responsibility over your work, right? So that's, those two words are what I like to use in my day-to-day -day when I'm asking someone to be held accountable for their work. I'll say things like, can you commit to completing the test protocol by this Wednesday? That shift, can you commit, is completely mind-blowing because before, I would say, can you have the test protocol done by Wednesday? When I say, can you commit to having it done by Wednesday, it forces them to actually commit to you. Instead of them saying like, yeah, I think I can get it done by Wednesday, they're going to tell you, yeah, I can commit to this Wednesday. And everyone in that call will hear them saying that they can commit to doing it. So I encourage you, if you haven't used those words before, try using those words. Try saying, can we do X, Y, and Z? Can you commit to X, Y, and Z? And it's going to change how you hold your team members to be more accountable for their work. And maybe you'll even be more on track with key deliverables in your timeline or certain activities that you have to deliver to your customer. You know, we're all here together and I fully believe in you wherever you are in your career. If you're just starting out as a project manager or maybe you're trying to go become a senior project manager or maybe a program manager, just know that I'm here for you and I hope that you're able to resonate with some of the biggest challenges and struggles that I've been experiencing. Definitely, if you haven't done so already, smash that like button so I know that you appreciate and that you like my content because it does inspire me to create more videos and high quality content just like this. Now, if you wanna see what I was talking about in my previous video, check this video out where I talk about what are the, some of the biggest challenges with growing a career as a project manager, and I'll see you in the next video.